So this talk um, is the fifth one. The first one was about the basics of functional programming, where we looked at recursion and, and how to divide problems into smaller problems, and how variables were immutable, and a um, little bit on types, I suppose. Second talk was, mo was mostly about mapping. Third talk was about lists and content, a lists and stuff. Uh, the fourth one was about lambdas and high-order functions and list list comprehensions, plus a bit about symbols. And it's still very much a spare time project. I am not a computer scientist. I don't pretend to be one, um, but I am a Lisp programmer. So um, I pretend to be at least a Lisp programmer. This is the list of advanced, quote unquote, advanced topics that I presented earlier. And today we will look at number five, seven, and eight. Scope and extent number six, I'll skip that because it's really about closures. So, and it's a fairly long topic and I don't think we'll have time to do that today and, and other things as well. So let's crack on with it, basically, and go into the tail recursion. Now, if you remember back to talk one, we divided a problem like calculating a factorial into calculating the factorial of zero and calculating the factorial of, of n where n is not zero. And you've seen this function, uh, which you'll see again on the next slide. This is the Emacs disassembly of the factorial function as it, as it was defined. If you can see my mouse, you can see that it calls itself recursively around line 12. And um, and that's how you get the recursion, because it calls itself, which is the, uh, the whole point of recursion. However, when you call yourself recursively, you will eventually run out of stack. Now, the stack might be a thousand deep or a hundred deep or something. At some point, it will set a limit to how many how many uh, times you can iterate, how many times you can recurse. So the first line is the, the actual factorial function as we used to define it. The second line, or the second um, code, piece of code, is how we're now going to define it. So you can see the first one, when we do the recursive bit, it says times k factorial 1 minus k. And that means that Emacs needs to remember the k until it has finished calculating factorial of 1 minus k. So if you calculate the factorial of 4, it will calculate it will have to remember the 4 while it can calculates the factorial of 3. It then has to remember the 3 while it calculates the factorial of 2. It remembers the 2 while it calculates the factorial of 1. And it remembers 1 while it calculates the factorial of 0, which is now the fixed number 0, uh, the fixed number we've got here. And then it can unwind the stack and say uh, 1 times 1 is 1, times 2 is 2, times 3 is 6, times 4 is 24. And it returns that result. But that's that number three. So if you remember one thing only from this talk, remember this next bit about getting a, a slightly different formatted version of the factorial function. So here I've got the result passed in as a parameter. So if k is zero, then return the result. If not, then do the factorial of one minus k and k times the result. So the nice bit about this is that when the recursion is called, it does not need to remember anything else because everything it needs to know is passed in in the result variable. So the downside of this method is, first of all, it's a less natural way of programming because the first one is like we would write it in mathematical notation, we will say n factorial equals um, n, and that's our recursion. The second option, where there's a result parameter, is less natural for us to 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 write as programmers, as uh, mathematicians, or, or whatever. But it allows a Lisp compiler to do optimization because it doesn't need to remember the k as it calls itself it can eliminate the call to itself and just code it as a loop. There's nothing it needs to remember when it calls itself. So it, it can say, well, actually, I'll just jump rather than call. 
So if you, we went back to this code where it says call one, it would in the similar piece of code, if we if we saw this for Emacs, it will just say jump one to uh, whatever the label one is here in, on line eight. And it would be a jump and it would never ever exhaust its stack because it's not actually adding stack frames to the recursion as it does it. It is just looping. It is written in code as a recursive call, but the compiler optimizes the recursion away and makes it a loop. So in that sense, we get the best of both worlds. Except I should add that Emacs does not do tail recursion optimization. At least this version of Emacs did not do it. Um, but it might come in at some point. Maybe compiler do tail recursion optimization. But it's worth knowing about because every other functional language will do tail recursion optimization. So it's an important technique for you to know about when you're a functional programmers. And in fact, I, I think for most of the rest of my talks, I will do tail recursive optimizable calls, which means that I will pass in this extra parameter. The advantage of doing this is that now I have to call factorial of whatever number I want, 12 and a one. I have to pass in a default value of one because the result has to start from somewhere and it has to start with a one so I can keep multiplying that one. The, the one is, is uh, the identity element for the multiplication. So my factorial function is suddenly less usable because I must pass in a one as the second uh, argument to the function. Otherwise, it just will not work. Similarly, um, I could do the iota function. If you remember, we used the iota function to generate a list of numbers from one to n or from zero to n minus one. And I can do this, the same thing in a tail recursion optimizable way by passing in a result parameter, which initially is the empty list. And then it keeps adding to that list. Um, and eventually it will just return it when, when it's finished doing its, its recursion. And if you remember all the way back to the original time, the, the, the first one we had, we had an, a reverse call at the end because it generates the list in reverse order because it counts down to zero. In this case, you may wish to, to have a think about why it doesn't need to do that. It doesn't need to reverse things. It will just generate it um, directly. So this extra parameter that we need to, to that we have in the call, um, one way of solving it is to use optional because that means if I don't pass it in, then Emacs will say, well, actually, there's a, a parameter here that is unset, so I will give it a, a, the value one here, um, because um, if, if result is not set, it will be nil, and then I can use or result one, and it will use one as a kind of default value. And then when it calls itself, result will be set, and it will just work as before. It will accumulate the, the the final value, the factorial, into the result um, variable, and everything will work as before. So this works very nicely as long as I remember to only call fact with a single parameter. And the the slight flaw in this plan is that um, the optional variables in Emacs Lisp do not have. Uh, you can't specify for that. I would have liked to say if you don't specify result, then make it at one, but um, Emacs does not support that in its lambda lists, lambda, uh, what's it called? The lambda argument lists. So another way of doing it is just to do the wrapper function like we saw in the first, um, in the first talk. So uh, the main function factorial will just handle the, the call itself and the inner function, the helper function, will be tail recursion optimizable and will actually calculate the factorial value. And in this case, I'm not using optionals. The outer function would just call the inner function and set the, the default result value to one. And this will work as well. So the tail recursion optimization will apply to the helper function. It will be optimized in a Lisp compiler that can do tail recursion optimization. So this is a very nice way of doing it. This is um, a sort of solves both problems. And if I do that, I can also put more stuff into the factorial function, into the outer function. 
so I can check if this is not an integer and if this is not a, um, a positive number and, and you're not trying to implement a gamma function, then, um, then throw an error. And if not, then call the inner function. This has the advantage, as I think we talked about somewhere, possibly in talk one, about wrapping the, the number checks outside of the helper functions. So that once the inner function runs, it is guaranteed to get a non-negative integer in k. Because the outer function guarantees it. So this means that I can optimize the inner function even more because it doesn't need to check that k is a positive integer. And we should see later in this talk how to do that, which means that it can optimize even more. If you disassemble Lisp code like this, you will sometimes see functions that has, oh, if I'm called with too many parameters, if I'm called with parameters that if the multipl multiplication doesn't work because these, this is not a number or some, all the kinds of mistakes that can happen in normal code. And you can optimize those away. You can, you can say these checks are not needed in the inner, inner pieces of code. So with this in mind, we can go back and visit the one question from the first talk, where if you remember, we were looking at a piece of code that quite simply took the length of, it was given a list of sequences, and it took the length of those sequences and compared them to just see that they were all the same length. And the exercise in talk one was to try and find a more optimized version of doing that in, in the sense that you could pass it in, in a, a million sequences. And if the second sequence is of a different length from the first one, then there's no point in calculating the rest because you just want to shortcut and say, well, actually, two of them are different, so they're not all the same. So here's a version of that, which is also tail recursion optimizable, I think. So it has the outer function that says, uh, if the list has zero or one element, then it is clearly true that all the lists have the same number of elements. If not, it will calculate the, the length of the first list and pass it into a helper function along with the rest of the, the lists. And you can see the two exit conditions. If it reaches the end of the lists, then they must all have been the same. If the length of the next list, the next sequence that we look at is different from the length that we are passed in, then clearly that one is different and we just, just return nil from the whole thing. And finally, it does the recursion and checks the same length uh, passing in the length again and the rest of the lists the rest of the sequences and you can see that uh, from the examples that it actually works very well i can pass in different kinds of sequences and it only looks at the length so the sequence could be a, a string it could be a vector it could be a list it doesn't matter it will just look at the length of the sequences and check that they're the same so this code is tail recursion optimizable because by the time the recursion call happens in the helper function there is nothing that it needs to remember. It just knows that it hasn't exited yet and it's keeping doing the recursion across the list, which is just like doing the CDR across the list. So that was tail recursion optimization. Now we'll go on a bit to look a little bit close, a little bit closer at types. So this thing was sequences. So it's expecting its argument to be a list. And each of the entries in the list is it's expecting to be a sequence. So in this example, which is a little bit contrived, um, so don't worry about it for now. Um, the first bit says if null k, then return something. And if the second example says if npk, then return something. If I pass in k as an empty list, then null k will be true and npk will also be true. So effectively, they're doing the same thing for the function process list. But the, if you remember from before, when I talked about the inner function and the, the fact that it can optimize things, when it knows that the k that it's got to process is a positive integer, it doesn't need to do any other checks on it. 
until it hits zero, it needs to check that it needs to stop. It doesn't need to check that if somebody passed a string in by mistake into my factorial function. So you can do things with types that um, can help the compiler optimize things. Null k is true only if k is nil. And it's nil for everything else. NPK is true only if k is nil. But it's an error if k is not a list. So the next bit to look at is types. So what happens when we look at types? The first function, actually, when I use reduce and map, those will actually work cheerfully with any kind of sequence. So process list, as, as the first implementation is, is written, will kind of work for any sequence, not just lists, except uh, null k is looking for the empty list, but nothing is looking for the empty vector, or nothing is looking for an empty string. So it will cheerfully call reduce or, or whatever um, on an empty string. It doesn't do the um, the bypass kind of thing. It only does the bypass on an empty list. So so what's the point of this? The point is that sometimes you want to tell Lisp that you have certain types that are guaranteed to be um, or supposed to be of a certain type. What I'm passing into this function is a list. And this lets Lisp optimize things a bit so that you can write better code because it can remove some of the checks potentially that it would normally have in default code. Now, Emacs probably doesn't do this, I suspect. It doesn't do a lot of uh, the declare instruction is accepted by Emacs, but it doesn't actually enforce them like a normal Lisp implementation would do, a common Lisp implementation. But before we look at that, uh, let's just think about what declare actually means. Because when I read this as a programmer, I can say, oh, actually, um, I know that, that k is a type list because it says so on the, in the code. Or the compiler can say, I know this is a type list because it says so in the code. Or it is likely to be a type of list, and I might want to optimize this, or I may not want to optimize this, depending on the optimization level that is set when you run your, your compiler. Or you could say maybe it's like a comment; it's just for the com for the for the programmer to look at. So there are kind of different things that declare can do in this context, and the question is, what is it? Was it? What is it actually doing? It is actually enforced. It is supposed to be absolutely, um, if, if it says declare that k is a list, then it is, I was about to say it's an error if k is not a list, uh, but there can still be different optimization levels in, in normal Lisp where you can have it remove some of the checks for performance reasons. So anyway, in functional programming, types are important for correctness because you try, you you track your types to try and make sure that you know what, what type everything is so that you try and make sure that your code is correct. This is a lot of modern programming is about tracking types of things and making sure that they are correct, which kind of sits at odds with Lisp, which has a very generic type system that where everything, um, as we shall see, if I just write a list of something, uh, K is a list, it can be a list of anything. It can be anything in that list. It doesn't, um, if I want to say that it's a list of integers, then I have to do something special, as we should see shortly. So it's partly for correctness, it's partly for performance, partly for optimization, because the, the uh, a Lisp compiler can take some of the checks out that it doesn't need to do when it knows that things are of a specific type. For example, if you look at reduce or, or, or map, they generally take sequences, and sequences can be vectors and strings and uh, lists. But if I know that the type I pass in is a list, then the compiler can optimize this and say, well, I know it's a list, so I'm going to throw away the code that handles vectors or strings, because I know that k is not a vector or a string, I can just straight call the list handling function um, of, of map or reduce. <clears throat> 
and optimize things that way. So it does not, when the function is called, it doesn't actually check, oh, what type of sequence is this? Because I know it's what kind of sequence it is. So you can see you can by, by having this sort of optimization. So the types can be specified in two ways. Uh, it can be specified by me, if I know what I'm doing, that I write in a declaration or I use the NP instead of null because I want to assert to my list code that this is a list and it's not a, a vector. But um, some list compilers are smarter as well. They can also infer what I've got. So for example, in this, this um, S expression, if I say floor um, A6, then it knows that A must be an integer because otherwise the call is invalid. And then it will assume that the re result of that, uh, because it's called with a plus, it will throw away the second value of floor. If you remember, floor in, in common list returns uh, the divisor and the quotient. In Emacs list, it doesn't. It just returns the divisor, the, 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 sorry, the quotient and the remainder, I wanted to say. Floor returns the quotient and the remainder, and in Emacs Lisp, it just returns the quotient. So mod B12 will do the remainder of, of B with, um, with respect to 12. So it knows that that is a number from 0 to 11. So Lisp in general can do some optimizations around this sort of stuff because it knows it's an integer and if it's a number from 0 to 11 then it's also a fixed num and it can do further optimizations and this is relevant because this also happens in other functional languages if you want to do work in in an ml language it will say yeah um, i know when you type in a list that it's a list and when you type in a list of integers i know it's a list of integers so an, an ML type language will actually reject, reject a list of mixed things. So here in um, an ML type language, I'm trying to pass in the number two, uh, a pair three comma one, and the string ADA. And it will reject that because the things I've got in my list are not of the same type. And it will refuse to work with those. Lisp, in contrast, is, is perfectly happy to do a list of, um, so I can pass in, uh, here I bind the, the symbol A to the, to the list consisting of the integer 2, the const cell 3, 1, and the string ADA, and it's perfectly happy doing that. So Lisp seems to have a much more loosely defined type system than uh, functional languages. However, I will try and show you today that they have a lot in common even if they look very different at this on this slide. So in a functional language like F sharp, for example, then I can put in a list of, of two, three, and four, and we'll say, yes, this is a list of integers. I recognize that it's a list, and I recognize that what's inside is an integer. And I can sort of do the same thing in Lisp as well. I can say, uh, if I create the list of two, three, four, is it a list? Yes, it is. If I want to say in Lisp that it's a list of integers, then I have to do something special. And this only works in common Lisp, I'm afraid. I have to define a, f a function that says um, every element I've got is an integer. And then essentially I say, is this list a type of both a list and every element inside is an integer? And then it will return true. Then it will do the full check for me, which is equivalent to what I've got in F sharp in the, in the top of the slide. So the list itself is a slightly loosely defined type in, in Lisp. It can, it can be a list of anything. And it's very hard to specify it to be a list of something very specific. Whereas in F-sharp or any other functional language like um, ML type language, it's very hard to do the opposite. It's very hard to say that I want a list of generic things. You have to say, I want a list of integers, or I want a list of floats, or I want a list of strings, because that is what it expects. It expects a list of a single type. And we'll return to this topic when we get to monads as well, um, much, much later. So the type system in Lisp, here's a partial picture that I tried to put together of it. Um, you can see everything is, uh, the arrow is uh, means subtype. 
So you can see the, the float has four different subtypes, short float, single float, double float, and long float. And in Lisp implementations, they can all be different. You can have four different flavors of floats. They're not required to be different. They, they can be the same. So some Lisp implementations will just provide two kinds of floats. So they might make the short float and the single float the same, and the double float and the long float together. At the moment, I cannot actually remember what Emacs does. I think it's just a single float type that it has, and, and not several. Also noteworthy is the type unsigned byte, which is a subtype of the signed byte. And you may wonder how that's possible, because normally you would say an unsigned byte is from 0 to 255, and a signed byte is from minus 128 to plus 127. However, Lisp somehow defines bytes as, a, as an integer rather than, um, uh, th than a specific, what we would call a byte. So an unsigned byte basically means from 0 to infinity, and a signed byte means from minus infinity to infinity, but integers. So they include fixed nums, um, not as subtypes, but, but as uh, uh, um, fixed nums are convertible to unsigned bytes, for example. But unsigned bytes are also what, what other languages will call begins. And the other thing to notice is, uh, so you've got complex, for example, and, and somewhere we've got array as well. And you can see null, the type null. The only thing that's of type null is the, the symbol nil, which is both a symbol and it's an empty list as well. So the type null is a subtype both of symbol and of list. And cons, a cons is obviously also a, a, of type list. And you can see on the far left, there's a type nil. Nothing is of type nil. Not even nil is of type nil. So it's the, the absolutely nothing is of this type. Um, so it's kind of a, not a subtype of, of anything, if, if you like. So um, this is just, an, and it's not even the full type system. There are things like path names and file, um, uh, file streams and, and streams and stuff that I haven't included in this. But this, this is the most interesting part of the, the, the types. So some of these types are interesting because they they can be composite types in a way that um, array and complex, which I think I mentioned before, they can be arrays of integers or they can be arrays of floats or arrays of complex numbers. And complex numbers can be complex numbers with um, integer, um, real and imaginary part, or they can be um, single floats or they can be um, double floats or, or whatever. So you can actually specify as a type specifier what sort of thing you want in your array. Precisely the kind of thing that we could not do with lists. So with a list, I could not specify, except by doing a fair bit of work, that I wanted this to be a list of, of precisely integers. But with an array, I can. Except it doesn't work in Emacs. Emacs will not let me specify specialized arrays. It will just let me say this type is an array. So um, what you see here is um, I create a vector in common Lisp, and it says this is a simple vector of length 3. So um, it gives me, when I ask it type of, it, it could have told me this is a simple vector. But it chose to tell me that it's a simple vector of length 3. So I can actually, in the type that it returned, when it tried to explain to me what it was uh, that I'm, um, I gave it, it chose to give me the specification that it's a the link, the, the type of the vector and the length of the vector, but not the type of the contents. It could have said this is a simple vector of length 3 whose elements are all integers, but it didn't say that. It just said it's a simple vector of length 3. So, um, and, and this, conversely, I ask it, uh, I give it the, the vector of 1, 2, 3, and I say, is this an array of integers of some arbitrary length? And it is indeed true. So the star here just means arbitrary anything. So for example, if I put in the next example, the first star says uh, there can be anything. It can have any type inside of the array. And the second star star in parentheses say that this is a, an array of rank two, where 
the dimensions are, again can be anything. So it doesn't have to be symmetric. It 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 is just like a, a rectangular um, set of numbers. You may want to think about why array t is a proper subtype of array star. So array t is an array that can hold absolutely anything in it, which is actually the default for an array. Why is that a proper subtype of array star? So I'll let you think about that. So this is the, the 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 types thing has so far been about having specifying types for things I have in my list. What if I don't want to specify the types in my list? What if I want to do generic programming? So in this case, now we're in the functional language world again, and I will as a simple example, let's use recursion just to find the length of a list, which is I know fairly trivial, but but just as an example. So I want to write this irrespectively of what the list type is. I want to the, calculating the, the length of a list does not depend on what the types are that I've got in my list. So in this case, um, as you can see, the function actually doesn't touch, it, it ignores the L of the car of the list and, and just processes this, the CDR of the list, the rest of the list. So it doesn't actually know there's nothing in this function that specifies what I have in my list. So the functional language will say this is a list of A, where A is a type that it has just made up. It uses a, a single quote A as a, an, a name for an arbitrary type. It returns an integer because the length of list is an integer. So it, it can actually say something about what it returns, but it can't say anything about what's inside the list. And this is the kind of generic programming that you get in, in functional languages that it derives what the type is because it's forced to be a, a specific type, but it doesn't matter what that type is. That type could match integer, it could match float, or it could match strings or whatever. It doesn't matter. So map, for example, will take as its argument a function that takes type A to type B, and then it returns a function that takes a list of A's into a list of Bs. So for example, if my, my function that I'm mapping, it converts a number into a string representation of that number, then the, the type A would be a number and the type B would be a string. That function will give me another function that takes a list of numbers and returns a list of strings. So the whole type stuff will work out in the end and resolve itself at the in the end. So let's return to this example of, of having mixed types inside of my um, my list as it is here. Um, if I actually really, really wanted to do that, I'd have to cre create a, a type that has um, different things in it. So a type can, that can be both a string or an integer or a float. And we will return to this topic again later when we get to the monads at the, the end of the monad section. And that also will cheerfully work, except I have to specify what the types are when I create the list. So I have to say an int of three, a string of ABC and a float of 1.2. And then it will deduce that to be a list of, of mixed. And again, it will be able to call list length of that because the type that I've got now that was that was A in my example is now mixed and it will, will cheerfully work with that as well. Uh, just for fun, I have done the same thing in C++ where you have templates and stuff to do generic programming. You can see it's, it's a rather longer piece of code, but it works exactly the same way by using recursion to go into the, um, to, to go through the list and um, eventually it will uh, derive the count of the list and, and return that. And I think, in fact, it's tail recursion optimizable as well, I think. So Lisp, of course, doesn't really care what you put into its lists. And unless you tell your arrays to do it, then they don't really care either. Um, if you just create an array, then by default, it can hold anything in it. And they don't have to be the same types at all. So you only want to specify the types if you have to that for optimization reasons or for correctness reasons. So 
if you do generic programming, you want to say um, the list length is, um, well, you can see the same function call here. Again, this I think should be tail recursion optimizable and it will just call itself and it has a result value, which is to see that it just returns at the end when it reaches the end of the list. And again, it works perfectly well on our mixed list. So one interesting thing to note that if I have different that I've got here of, of my um, in, in my list, then C++ will generate different code blocks for the different types. So if I have a list of integers, it will generate uh, instantiate the template for the list of integers. And if I have a list of floats, then it will instantiate the template for a list of floats and effectively duplicate the code. And Lisp does, does not do that. It just calls the same code for whether you pass it a list of integers or a list of strings or, or whatever, it doesn't really care. It calls the same code anyway. Okay, so that's it for types for now. Um, this is just to have a second look at types and, and to notice when you will want to specify what the types are. We will look at it again with declarations and, and how to use those for optimization when we get to some of the more interesting bits. Emacs doesn't do many of those optimizations, I'm afraid, and not at the moment, but uh, eventually maybe it will, it will be able to support tail recursion optimization and, and declare optimizations. So for the rest of the talk, uh, let's just look briefly at dividing problems. So if you remember when we did functional programming, we had, um, we divided the problem into different sub-problems that we could then solve individually. And sometimes that meant calling ourselves as we reduced the, the list of, of uh, if I have a list of length five and I want to know the length of that list, then I reduce it by one element and I call my length of the list of, of the shorter list and add one to the result. Of course, when I want to do tail recursion optimizable, then I'll do it slightly differently. But, but effectively, I reduce the problem to a smaller problem, and until I, I get a li list of length, an empty list which is of length zero, and then then I'm done. So, in functional languages, one of the tools that it gives you to 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 reduce the problem into subproblems is pattern matching. So this again is a slightly contrived example. It says, um, uh, just just trans translating this, it says, um, rec says to make this function recursive. And the function is called func, and it's passed in two argu arguments, data and sum. The first argument is just the actual data that we want to look at, and sum is the, the result that I want to return because I want to be tail recursion optimizable. So I have the accumulator as one of my arguments to, to the function. So the, the match function now says, if the list that I'm passing in, the data list, is matches the empty list, then just return sum. This is the same as we did before, where I just check for the empty list, and if the empty list is, is if the list is empty, then I can just return whatever is in the accumulator. Now it says, match the, the first element of the list with a pair of A and B. So it expects the list to con contain a pair of something. Uh, and then the double colon says the CDR, what we would call the CDR or the, or the rest of the list is, is in the variable called rest. Then there's a guard. The guard says when A is greater than B, then call the function on uh, with the rest as the parameter and add A to the sum in the next call. So effectively, it's taken the, the larger pair of numbers in that list and just added it to the sum. The next line says, um, ignore the first line, ignore the first bit, and then call itself with a sum and with b added to it. So, so the, the first of the matches matches the empty list. So if the list is empty, then, then we know where to stop. This is the stop condition. The next one matches a pair, but only when the first element of the pair is greater than the second element of the pair. When it matches a pair, 
and that is not true, then it will go to the third one. And in that case, we ignore the first element and we just match on the, on the, we just extract the second element of the pair and we pass it into the function call. And finally, if I get anything else that is not a pair, uh, which is probably impossible in a functional language, then it's going to fail. Saying I couldn't. Seeing this code, our functional language compiler will, will deduce that data is a list of pairs of integers or possibly numbers. Uh, no, it, I think it will probably say they're integers because plus is an integer addition. There's a, I seem to remember some languages have a plus, plus dot, which is the floating point addition. Um, but it doesn't matter. It can, the point is it can infer what the types is of everything. It infers what the type of A and B are, and it infers what the what data is. So, and in my test case, um, I pass it in a list of three, one, four, uh, blah, 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 four, one, two, three. And of every pair, it extracts a larger number in the pair and adds those together and eventually returns that result. And it's tail recursion optimizable. So uh, an F-sharp compiler or, or whatever functional language you use will optimize it and, and not do a recursive call, despite the fact that it says recurse here in the, in the, in the, the first line, but optimize it as a loop. Um, so and again, I can use the mixed type as well. Um, I can use, uh, so the point is I can use, uh, we will actually get to this, I think, when we get to monads as well. Um, because if I'm past the mixed type, I don't necessarily know what's inside. So, uh, because it could be a float, it could be a string, it could be an integer, and I don't know what it is. So I need to take it apart, and I can do that using the pattern matching as well. So here's an example of um, exactly the same mixed type as before, where I say, um, I'm going to call this function with an element which is of mixed type. This is an example of where I have specified what type is at the element is. And I will say, match the element with, if it's a float, then say it's a float. If it's a string, then say it's a string, and so on. Now here, the compiler will actually say that if, if suppose I miss a case, it will say, oh, you missed a case. If if there were if I someday extend mixed to also have a uh, an array in it or something else of, of, of a different type, and I forget to put that into my explain function, then it will say when I compile it, it will say, oh, actually you forgot to put something else in. So um, it will be able to check that I've covered all the cases that are possible. So. Um, if I call uh, list.iter, which is the iterate function, um, with the explain function as a, as a, a like we do map, and I pass it this thing, then it'll say it's found an integer of length two, it's found a float of um, 2.71, blah, blah, and it's found a string. So it works really well because it can now decompose, um, it, it can open up that union type of mixed, the, the mixed types here, and, and pick out whichever elements I wanted from it and treat them in different ways now. So I have shown you functional languages, F-sharp in this case, and I've even shown you some C++ and stuff. So you can do something similar in Lisp using destructuring bind. And the history of destructuring bind was that it was used in macros. In macros, they said, you will probably want to extend the Lisp language by writing macros. And to do that, you will need to have structures like in, in a thing like do list, for example, if you remember what it looks like, uh, you have some parentheses with a, a variable and a list you want to iterate over, and then you have the body of the function. So you will probably write, want to write that sort of stuff. So the wise people behind Lisp chose to introduce a thing called destructuring into macros, macro definitions, that you can't do in other function calls. And eventually somebody figured out that it was actually a useful thing to have, so they made it available as a standalone facility called destructuring bind. So what it does is it takes this list structure of a, b, dot, c, and tries to match that against the list it's given. And if it matches, 
then it will bind A to whatever it it matches. It matches. It will bind B to whatever it matches. So it works in in a way exactly like the the A comma B pair that we had here. A will bind to the first element of the pair. B will bind to the second element of the pair. It will work exactly the same way in Lisp, except it's a more gener generic feature. It doesn't just match pairs. It matches um, any sort of list structures that you might choose to make. And because Lisp code is entirely made up of list structures, then that is a very useful facility. So in this case, you can see it has matched A to 2. It has matched B to um, the list of fg.y, and it has matched C to nil, because nil sort of um, uh, kind of didn't match anything, because it's it's the second element of a dotted pair. If you actually sit down and draw the const cells, you can see that it makes sense. On the other hand, if I try to do destructuring bind and it doesn't work, so A, B, C, um, it will not match the list of one, two, because there's no way for me to construct an inner list out of that. And it will just raise an error. It will fail. It will not return nil. It will not return at all. It will raise an error saying it failed to match. So now I sort of have the, the binding bit of my thing. Like I can do the A pairing, but I can't do the guard. Because if the, if the pairing sort of fails, then uh, it, it, it may do the binding, but it's too late to do the guard of, of that binding because it has already bound my variables. It will not drop through to the next case if I try to do that, if you see what I mean. It will, it will bind there and then it said it's bound and it will not do the other cases later because the binding is successful. And then when the guard fails, then I'm kind of, you know, stuck. If that doesn't make sense, then, then have a look at this example. So this function that I have in F sharp, let me try and translate that to Lisp and let's see what it looks like. So here's the first very crude attempt. So, so um, please don't just try this at home. Um, what it's trying to do is to use cont where I used match before. And it says, if I got the empty list, then just return the sum, which is fine. If the first element of the pair is bigger than the second element of the pair, then recursively call myself with the rest of the list and the sum with the first element of the pair added to it. Then it says, if I have a const, uh, why is it saying that actually? I'm suddenly getting confused. Oh, it's probably doing it in a different way. Just to confuse myself. Um, so you can see this looks a little bit clunky. It's nowhere near as readable as the F-sharp code was. And it's a little bit handmade. So it will actually, um, yeah, so so the, the third test is actually, um, it will still work as before, but it's, it looks clumsy. It's, it's hard to read. So can we do better? So one way that would make it better is to use destructuring bind. But the trouble with destructuring bind is that it will raise an error if it fails to bind, which is not what I want. I want it to just drop through to the next case in the cond. So where you had to match blah data with something, and then you have all the cases, it will stop when eventually it finds a match. And this is exactly what cont does as well. So I want to use cont. Cont does exactly the right thing. But I want it to, when it doesn't match, I want it to just drop through to the next case in the cont. So if I wrap destructuring bind with ignore errors, then ignore errors will capture any error that may be raised by destructuring bind and just return nil. So what it says is, if the first element of my data, which is the, where I had the pair, now matches a const cell of A and B, and the value of A is greater than the value of B, then recursively call myself. This is much closer to the F-sharp 
stuff I had before. Arguably, it's still a bit ugly because I need the ignore errors wrapper around it and I need to write the destructuring bind by hand. But if you really wanted to, you could actually um, make this a little more elegant by using macros and stuff. But the point is that it is much closer to what was intended in the F sharp code because it will now create the binding inside of the const cell out of that structure. In this, say, in this case, it's a simple const cell, so it maybe it's not worth all this effort. But, um, but uh, just to show you that it can be done, I can match on a pattern, as long as it's a list-based pattern, I can bind the variables inside of that list pattern, and I can do guards on it as well by having um, extra conditions on those patterns. And if anything fails, if the binding fails, if the guard fails, it will drop through to the next case in the cont, just like the F-sharp code did. So this is what I want. And of course, over the years, people have needed something like something similar, and they have introduced slightly better ways of doing this. So Common Lisp have a, has a library called Alexandria that has helper functions. Dash for Emacs, if you're doing uh, functional programming in Emacs, it will have functions that are kind of like this as well. So um, you have uh, let functions, for example, that can do destructuring, that can help you write more elegant code as well. So um, just nearly wrapping up now, um, of course, it would be much cleaner to just um, split the problem up because we're doing functional programming. So why not just split the function up into a function that takes the larger element of a pair and returns that? And then I just use the reduce function over that with an ad addition and just sum them up. And, and I just, instead of coding everything in, into a single function, admittedly, this was a little bit of an artificial example, you know, but, um, but um, splitting the problem actually makes it cleaner still. That, um, so here, my first function will take the the element of the list and destructure it into a pair, and it then adds the first of those elements into the sum. And then I would call the reduce function with this function onto my list with an initial value of zero, and lo and behold, it returns the value 12 as before. So all of this stuff was just really to show you that destructuring can actually be useful and interesting. Uh, to pattern match against lists. If you look at functional code, it will very often use that match thing. And um, functional uh, programming uses that a lot. So it kind of makes sense to know a little bit about how to do this in Lisp as well, even if it's slightly less elegant in Lisp. And you may also like to note that loop can also destructure. So implicitly in loop, if I say loop for AB in that list, um, I can do it exactly the same as the code above does in a like a, almost a single line loop for AB in the list of three one four one da 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 summing max AB and it will do exactly the same thing AB AB loops over the list and it does the destructuring binding A to the first element of the pair and B to the second element of the pair and with that we have reached the end of this talk. So I have told you about recursion, how to do tail recursion optimization. I've told you a bit about types. Uh, so we had another look at types. We'll probably look at them again and how we can use declarations to optimize our code. And finally, I looked at the pattern matching and stuff and how we can do sort of similar things in Lisp. And you can see that sometimes you can write code in different ways and um, even loop can be very useful um, sometimes. So thank you very much for listening on this very hottest possible day of the year, if you're in the UK. So next talk will be about scope and extent, which is um, the same essentially as talking about closures. And I will probably call, um, talk about memoization as well, which is where you use the facility of, of functional, uh, pure functional functions to always because they always return the same thing every time you call them, you can actually, if it's an expensive call, you can remember what, it, what result it gave you. Uh, so that will be the next one. And the one after that will be about lazy evaluation types and, and all sort of crazy things, um, sequence, series, 
pipes stuff. 